ground. Another man runs into the elephant's tail and says, wow, an elephant is a lot like a fine calligraphy brush. It's small and delicate. And the final, the fourth man says, I think an elephant is a lot like a wall. It's huge, it's broad, it's flat, because he's feeling the elephant's back. And so the use of evo evoking this story, um, they use it in the same way that we would use the idiom missing the forest for the trees. Each person is so wrapped up in their own experience of a small part of a phenomenon that they are unaware of the entire reality of the elephant, and none of them comes to a real or, um, realization of what an elephant is actually like. And I know this is how I feel in a lot of my um, approaches. Um, I know when I started graduate school, I felt like I knew a lot, <laughs> and I felt like I, I understood the world, and I was just out to you know go out there and make changes. And then the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. And I think that's probably the end result of most of our educations. But I think a lot of us feel like blind men. The more we realize is out there, the more we realize we don't even have the first clue about what reality is. And so I like to um, use this metaphor to look at the way we understand the world. To us, the natural world is an elephant. It's something that we have a little bit of experience with, but it's still very big, uh, incomprehensible to a single one of us. But we've developed very good ways of knowing to this point in history. Um, in the natural world, we can use the scientific method. We can have um, good documentation. We can communicate with other academics. We can start to understand how the world works and little by little as the years go by, gain a better understanding of what an elephant may be like. However, there's another factor that comes in that to me was really emphasized by the concepts in developmental evaluation and also in Eisner's approach to ed educational criticism. And that is a factor that I'm going to call human agency. And <clears throat> human agency, um, kind of in my use of the word here, is the ability and the tendency of humans to act and be a direct influence on their world. And it's based on the um, premise, kind of the underlying ontological premise, is that we do have free will. We do have agency to change the world. I know different perspectives might not bring this into the same importance that my assumptions are because if you go by, for example, Skinner's model, humans aren't actually agents in the world. They're conditioned and are part of it as much as anything else. But we're going to start from the assumption that humans do have the ability to, to change, to make an unpredictable choice, to do something you, you wouldn't be able to predict that they would do. And so if we look at the world in this sense, we have all of these other things that come into play. If you have human agency, if you have people acting on the world and doing crazy, unexpected things, you have these other factors pop up. For example, intersubjectivity. Maybe we can predict to what we think is a very good level of probability what one person is going to do, but what happens when that one person talks to another person? What happens when they create something between themselves? Um, we also have the, com the uh, concept of complexity, which Dr. Patton describes which was very enlightening to me because it explained really well something that I had sensed for a while. I'd been frustrated with ideas of making models of the world and trying to understand and predict because I saw so many cases where that didn't work. And what I realized is what I was looking at was complex situations. And he makes the distinction between complicated situations and complex situations. For example, sending a rocket to the moon is a complicated situation. There's a lot of variable, there's a high degree of uncertainty, but there's not a high degree of conflict <coughs> because a lot of people are working together to achieve it. So it's difficult and there's a lot of work we need to do, but it's something that we can get a handle on and make it work. A complex situation, on the other hand, has high degrees of uncertainty and high degrees of conflict in the goals of the various uh, stakeholders. And so um, it, it enters a new realm of unknowableness that our traditional methods aren't quite able to, to um, comprehend. The third phrase I, choose, I chose to introduce as an aspect of human agency is the idea of unknown unknowns. And I borrowed this from our friend Donald Rumsfeld. Um, <laughs> but I thought it was a very evocative way to explain the fact that when you're touching an elephant and you're a blind man and you're understanding everything you can in your own realm, there are things that exist that are part of that animal that you don't even think to consider because you're not aware of them. That is an unknown unknown. You don't just not know something. You don't even know you don't know it. 
And finally, the idea of gestalt, the idea that things become more than the sum of their parts, that two things that I maybe have an understanding of beforehand when they interact may make changes, become something else that I did not predict from seeing them beforehand. So we introduce this and we get a human world, which is a lot fuzzier, a lot messier, a lot more dynamic, and frankly a lot more fun than the natural world. And I think this is the point where the starry-eyed graduate student says, oh, maybe I don't know everything. Um, I've tried to illustrate it a little bit with these circles and trying to evoke a little bit of movement and change. Um, and this also um, includes the concept that Dr. Patton brought forward about having a dynamical system. Not only is it dynamic, changing, it's changing at an unknown rate. So we can't plot its course, we can't see where we think it's going to be because we don't know if it's going to speed up or slow down. And a lot of human situations end up being dynamical systems. So how do we even get a grasp on that? And that is what I, um, I really learned from these two texts. We have, here we are as blind men, as researchers in the human world, dealing with these different subjects. And what are we going to do to try to improve our ability to really understand and grasp what's there? Um, this is the other text that I read as um, part of this class was The Art of Educational Evaluation by Eisner. And uh, it spoke to me. I was um, part of my underground my undergrad background was in art, and so I really understood the idea of art criticism, of writing prose about things. Actually, it was kind of terrible. My first few um, papers as a graduate student in education, you could tell I didn't know how to write scientifically. I was writing as if I was an art critic. Um, so it was, it was kind of heartening for me to see, oh, no, maybe that's okay. Um, and so the way that Eisner uh, proposes that we talk about art is that we, or that we talk about education, is that we treat it as if it was a work of art, like an art critic or a food critic would talk. Um, in his argument, we are used to reducing a really complex situation into discrete factors that we've predetermined, whereas uh, a format such as criticism is a detail-rich method of reporting. Rather than trying to take an entire experience and reduce it down to this factor and this factor, and then reporting that to someone else, we're reporting the entire experience through the lens of, and he emphasizes the fact that we need to be connoisseurs, that we need to know, we need to be experts in our, in our field. But through the lens of a knowledgeable connoisseur, the world becomes um, a lot more nuanced, and, it, and it's a lot better way to communicate <coughs> what you're experiencing in an educational context. And so um, I pictured um, Eisner's ed educational critic as one of our blind men out there feeling the world, but trying to do his best to report that to others through a different medium than what we're used to. And I also saw Patton's developmental evaluation as another way for us to increase our understanding of a world like this. And what this is, I, I call it an approach towards gaining a four-dimensional understanding of the world. And I mean that by including the aspect of time. Um, I think developmental evaluation approaches time in a very effective way because it doesn't assume that we know the outcomes before we start. We don't decide which factors we're going to look for. We don't decide which model we're going to use before we even get into the situation and know what's happening. Um, with investment with the shareholders and with, uh, with the stakeholders, I don't know why I was talking about with the stakeholders and with uh, a continuing and kind of longitudinal work on any situation, we're turning what used to be kind of a 3D snapshot of a situation into a 4D understanding. And it brings into account an understanding of complexity, which I thought was essential in a messy human world that we lived in. Um, these are still kind of the rambling thoughts of a novice. Um, but for me, it was very helpful to start to understand that we can approach the world in these very different ways. That it's not about um, deciding, you know, which discrete factors we're going to search for and then implementing something, filling out our model, and calling it done. It's a lot more like real life. It's a lot more like we would approach a human relationship, like we would approach a new job, a new assignment. It's the kind of thing you get in, you get to know the people. You start to learn and you change yourself along with the changing system. And so for me, it makes a lot of sense 